introduction of tonight's authors, and then we are going to launch right into the discussion. So again, thank you everyone for bearing with us. Um, I'm Lila, I'm the events editor at Porter Square Books, a local independent and employee owned bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we're really pleased to have Aliyah Don Johnson and Kate Elliott here tonight. Um, both have brand new, really wonderful books uh, of Aliyah Don Johnson's Trouble the Saints. N.K. Jemison wrote, Juju Assassin's Alternate History, A Gritty New York Crime Story. In a word, awesome. And Kate Elliott's Unconquerable Son was described as Kirkus Reviews as enthralling, edge of your seat stuff hurtling along at warp speed. Elia Don Johnson has been recognized for her short fiction and YA novels, winning the 2015 Nebula Award for Best Novelette for A Guide to the Fruits of Hawaii, which also appears in the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy uh, 2015, guest edited by Joe Hill. Her debut YA novel, The Summer Prince, was longlisted for the National Book Award for Young People's Literature, and her follow-up novel, uh, YA novel, Love is the Drug, won the Andre Norton Award in 2015. A native of Washington, D.C., Johnson is currently based in Mexico City. Actually, I just learned that she moved to Mexico, uh, where she received a master's degree in Mesoamerican studies and sings in a blue band, uh, blues band. Kate Elliott has been writing science fiction and fantasy for 30 years after bursting onto the scene with Jaron. She is best known for her Crown of Stars epic fantasy series and the New York Times bestselling YA fantasy Port of Fives. Elliott's particular focus is immersive world building and centering women in epic stories of adventure amidst transformative cultural change and she lives in Hawaii where she paddles outrigger canoes and spoils her schnauzer. So Aliyah and Kate, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you everybody for sticking with us and coming over to Zoom. Really appreciate it. Um, and I think we're going to kick things off by having both Aliyah and Kate tell us a little bit about their books and, and maybe read a little bit. So um, Aliyah, do you want to take it away? Sure. Thank you so much, Lila. Um, thanks you so much, everybody who like stuck with us and is still here, so we can actually have this wonderful event. Um, so this is this is like the galley copy of my novel, Trouble the Saints, although it exists now as a beautiful hardcover. Um, and it is let's say like my my most elevatory like kind of stuck elevator pitch is that it's um, set in New York City at the kind of right at before the U.S.'s entrance into World War II, and it tells the story of a, um, a hit woman for the mob in a world where uh, people of color and other, other marginalized people can have access, or some of them are born with the power of the hands, of the saints' hands. It's kind of like a slight edge, a slightly uncanny ability that they have, and in her case, it's that she has uncannily good aim, and she has use that um, in the service of a white mobster. Um, she herself is a light-skinned black woman from Harlem who is passing uh, in her capacity as his angel of justice. And the story begins with her 15 years after she began, um, a lot of kills under her belt, kind of in a very classic noir fashion, realizing that the choices she's made weren't the ones she thought she was making and that she wants to be able to salvage something of of her life and her sense of self and it goes on from there um and and it kind of so it's like this noir exploration it definitely juju assassins but also um issues of violence issues of of power um all sorts of stuff so i'm going to read like the very 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 first part of this novel <laughs> and then i guess we can talk about it all right I woke with the dream late on a Thursday night sometime in July. Tell me, the dentist said when he lit my cigarette. He was using the lighter Dev gave me after I dropped mine in the Hudson, the one I kept by my bed still. I blew a shaky plume that scattered in the crosswinds of the fan and the raunchy East River musk slinking through my open window. Was I in it? He asked, but I didn't say anything. The dentist was nervous, which made me laugh a little considering, and he eyed the holster hanging easy and loose on the post of my bed. Nope, I said, but Vic was. The dentist, my lover, squeezed my shoulders. He was looking at me like anyone might, or at least anyone who heard that Victor's angel had at last just had her second dream. Like he was working out which runner would take his numbers on the day, hour, and minute of my death. 
You get the hands with a dream, a dream that runs true. In Harlem, we might throw a party, we might keep it real quiet. Sometimes an extra dose of juju doesn't go over real well with the neighbors, but we always play the numbers. The dream that gives you the hands never fails, they say. Well, what the Lord giveth, he can take it the hell away. You get a second dream, you and your uncanny hands better play the numbers so your widow can pay for your casket. Victor came up to me in the pelican with Red Man just behind him. He said, he's a job for you, Phyllis LeBlanc. And then I was standing next to him in this long white dress I had on my holster, but there were two severed hands in it instead of my knives. And then Red Man pointed to me and said, you killed that man, just like the end of some Charlie Chan flick. Can you believe it? As if that would surprise anyone, let alone Red Man. The dentist didn't laugh. And then? A wind blew through, a hot wind, and it was so bright and blue I could hardly see. Just the red man's silhouette like a halo. He lifted his arms and said, don't fail us. And then I heard someone's voice calling my name. That was it. Don't fail? Now the dentist laughed. Have you ever failed at killing someone, darling? My heart puckered like an old wound. No. Are you sure it was really that kind of dream? My hands still ached from the memory of it all. The last time the dream came down, I'd been 10 years old, and my easy knack for throwing darts had become overnight. The uncanny force that makes folks slide away from you at church but come up to you after to ask for their numbers. They said we had saints' hands, called us jujus and witches and confidence artists. You believed or you didn't, no matter to the hands. They were our latter-day flood, or our plague, descended upon us after emancipation. Ever since we moved north, the extra had run in my family. My great-uncle could tell a card just from touching it, and my great-great-grandmother could pick up lightning in a storm. Mama used to say that there were fewer of us in every generation, so she didn't know why the dreams had, stuck, had struck two of her three children. I think she wanted to believe that it wasn't her fault, especially after my brother died, especially after I went downtown. But now, I hadn't done a job for Victor in nearly seven months. I told the man who gave me my pass that I was thinking of a different future. He hadn't said no. It was, I said soft, that kind of dream. Wow, quite an introduction. That's really exciting. And, and Kate, why don't you jump in and, and, uh, and give us a little bit of an intro to your book? I, I will, but first I want to say how wonderful it is to hear you read that because I read it on the page, but when you voice it, I don't know, it brings, <laughs> it brings a lot of emotion out. Now I want to hear the whole, now I want to hear that whole book on audiobook. Seriously. Read yeah, by Elias. There's a lot of, there, yeah, it's, um, yeah, anyway, anyway, uh, I have a super easy pitch because it's real. It's totally like, I didn't even have to make it up because it's what this book is. Gender swapped or gender spun and gender spun Alexander the Great in space. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's the story of Alexander the Great in space only with everybody spun around um, and the society spun around in a lot of different ways. So I'm just going to read the first page up till the question. Chapter one. The battered fleet returned to Melosia system without fanfare or announcement. Military personnel striding across the main concourse of Na Naval Command Orbital Station, Yanshi, slowed their steps as they looked up. One by one, ships slid into view across the threshold of a beacon's aura. The beacon itself was so distant, it was no more than a pin prick of light as viewed by the naked eye. So the arriving ships were visible from the station only because their images were being superimposed on the concourse's transparent shell. A young woman had halted at an optimal distance to get the best angle on the huge curved viewing window. Anzu, Kolea, Asphodel Crane, Alicanto, that's the, the Bosajo. That's not a Corvette, princess, said the burly soldier who stood beside her. Octavian had been making visual sweeps of movement in and out of the gates that connected the concourse to the various rings, nodes, and piers of the station. He tipped his chin up as he glanced at the enlarged image. It's a Corsair, 
They're both built for atmosphere landings from the same original Yele design, but, but a Corsair has an additional comms bulb, bulb on the exterior because it usually hunts alone and can't rely on a task force's greater comms reach as a fleet corvette does. She tilted her head to the left. I see the extra bulb now. His lips quirked. I was worried for an instant there that you hadn't been paying attention in class. The Corsair must be one of the local Nairi mil militia ships that got commandeered by our fleet before the battle. It wasn't assigned to my attack group. A spontaneous cheer rose from the concourse as a Tulpar class battlecruiser, much larger than the corvettes and fast frigates in the vanguard, appeared out of the beacon's aura. Seems the Bulkephalus's part in the engagement has reached fleet ears, observed, observed Octavian, indicating the battlecruiser. Will it be enough? Will what be enough, princess? Pretty tantalizing start. Well, I want to definitely invite the two of you to, you know, ask each other any questions um, you'd like. I have a couple to get us started, and definitely um, all the attendees should feel free to put any questions for Elia or Kate in the Q and A, and um, we'll we'll get towards those to those towards the end. So why don't we start? I'm just interested to hear um, where you both came up with these. Uh, you know, with the, the starting point for these stories. So Kate, why don't you start off and, and tell us, um, how did you get to a gender spun space Alexander the Great? Well, I have to say here, and some people might already know this, that I have three children and one of them is named Alexander. So I have actually been interested in that story for a long time. Um, I'm not sure why, but that there it is. And, but my, my interest got reignited in terms of doing something different with it when I was doing the research for my young adult trilogy, Court of Fives, which is, uh, I did a lot of research on Ptolemaic Egypt when the Macedonians came into Egypt after the Persians had been ruling it and they took over. And first it was the Ptolemaic dynasty and then the Romans came in um, after they uh, killed Cleopatra who was the last Ptolemaic monarch. And it's a fascinating period, but that kind of reignited my interest in Alexander the Great, because of course he is the predecessor of all that happened and of the whole Hellenistic era happened because of his conquest, his campaign. And there's actually another part to this story, which is that some years ago on a blog, someone had finally, someone who didn't normally read romance novels had been convinced by some friends to read some romance novels and they had started them with what became a kind of a fashion, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago where you would have like a set of siblings, you know, you have the five siblings and then they would each get their own romance novel. So it, these, are, these are historical romances. And they were saying, oh, I read this, this was really great. And I thought, wait a minute, that would make a good story. You could do like, you could take this history and then you could take each of Alexander's companions and give them each their own romance story through the thing. And then because I'm me, it didn't say like that, but that was the genesis of it. And I always knew that if I told it that and set it in space, that I would um, change gender and change the society so that I could have, uh, that I could do this gender swap gender thing with it. That's where it comes from. Wow, that's so interesting. And okay, so Alaya, you have a couple of different things also coming together in your book. There's sort of a New York City crime, historical fiction, fantasy, the aforementioned Juju assassin. So how did, um, what kind of brought all those together in, in your mind to create this? Um, you know, it's interesting. I definitely I like historical fiction. I, I, I have, um, I love New York. So the idea of, of like historical fiction in New York, I think is something that had been kind of bubbling around in my head. Um, and I really wanted to tell us, I feel like the thing that first came to me was this, this image of Phyllis, um, the main character, as, as this kind of world weary assassin who doesn't want to do it anymore, who's been duped by someone but also kind of by herself 
Um, and and who and this is kind of like one of those sort of key, the kind of like the key entry point to me was was this this deep passionate relationship she had shared with with someone who was totally outside of her world ten years before the start of the story. So someone with with way too much of a savior complex who would try to to kind of bring her out um, and rescue her, and it, and it ended as badly as as one can imagine that um, trying to save a grown woman is going to end. And um, and they're just kind of swimming or, or living or doing in the wreckage of that, you know. And then ten years later, something snaps and it kind of brings back the story of what happened ten years before. And so those those central elements of of Phyllis, um, the club, Dev, her ex lover, uh, the the would be savior, and and this kind of story that she told herself that was never quite true, um, and that. And then as she got older, it got harder and harder to believe that it was true. And so I, what I really wanted was to have that tension between kind of her past ideals and her present self. And so then the, the juju hands and the, you know, just the saints hands in general, um, that dropped in. I mean, at the beginning, it was, it was very clear to me that I wanted it to be a kind of magical counter structure, like a, a certain pushback against the absolutely very real, no magic needed, um, patriarchal white supremacist structure of like 1940s New York um, or the U.S. and the world. Okay, so so the um, what I so that was it was one of those things where I thought, okay, I mean that exists and it's got tons of power and it needs no magic. But what I was interested in was was allowing magic to to suffuse the novel in a way that it really does in the sense of of kind of folkways and and traditions and other and pe conquered peoples in all sorts of senses using their own belief systems and their own kind of ways of knowing as a form of resistance right and so that was that so that was why like kind of a lot of the the, the juju hands is, is inspired in a lot of ways by traditions of conjure um in black community and so that and so that kind of come it came together as a way of of demonstrating that there are people who in certain localized circumstances can get a, a leg up can kind of get more power despite the fact that there is this overpowering system on top of them you know even even though and that kind of juxtaposed itself also with violence in the way that that historically and, and currently violence is most often and most brutally used by by the ruling class, you know, but people who are been abused and are under that power structure can still sometimes, you know, sometimes very unsuccessfully, sometimes more successfully, but violence also has a way of opening up a little space sometimes for, for underprivileged people. And that also has a cost. It's a very, very hard cost. And that's really what the book is dealing with. Um, and then of course there's, her passing, which is something that I also wanted to, I've, I've always wanted to write a novel that dealt with passing in a really, in a more nuanced way than I usually see it. Obviously there's, there's fabulous antecedents of passing novels. I mean, famously Nella Larson's passing um, and in her other novel, Exit novel, because she actually wrote one that got destroyed, uh, called Quicksand. And they're both in their own way. Um, Quicksand isn't necessarily about passing. I think maybe the character does it like for a few seconds, but um, passing, explicitly is, you know, and so it's very, very interesting to to go back and read those stories of someone who was writing at the time period, you know, in the 20s of the 20s, and and me going back to the 40s and 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 our perspectives, both as light-skinned black women writing about that particular kind of set of historical circumstances, you know. And so so that was like all of that kind of came together, basically. Like the whole because the whole linchpin of it is is how we navigate our place in the world when we're underneath these, these really brutal and repressive systems. There, there's actually, can I, can I just follow up? Because there's a really interesting point in here about violence. We, we live in a, because we live in an empire, we live in a society that was founded on violence, sustained by violence, maintained by violence. And it's fascinating to me as someone who likes to think it's not a good solution ethically or morally. Also knowing that it has been a, and I don't wanna say good, an effective solution for a long time. 
and how a person, how does a writer deal with maybe their own sense of ethically, how do I feel about this? And yet also this is a story that we see told over and over again. One of the things about the story of Alexander the Great that, that I noticed doing research into it, into, into his life, was how different views of him, how views of him change over time. So the Romans admired him because he was considered the best general. Well, they were an empire. They needed the best general. So he, that was admirable. And then in the Victorian era, he was, he brought with the British historians saw him as someone who brought enlightenment to those, you know, those, des, those people ruled by despotic um, Orientals, as they would have said, even though the Persian Empire was actually the first multi-ethnic empire and was nothing like this view of them, right? But he brought enlightenment to them. He understood peace as a global thing that he would bring. Well, I'm doubtful that was the case. And then more recently, there's been the bad Alexander. He was horrible and evil and, you know, it was really, or his really, it was dad who was good. I mean, so it's interesting to me to watch these different views of him, which represent the different views, the people who are writing about him. And then to know that I am also as a writer grappling with history, both his actual history, what we know of it, and our own relationship to that history. And that's something that writing can do. And with your novel as well, it's something that fiction can do really well. Yeah, I feel like, you know, both of our novels in a lot of ways are, are kind of changing things a little. Um, probably in your case a lot, but in, in some ways, you know, I'm sure that you're like adhering very closely to, to, to kind of like the spirit of, of the proceedings, you know, like that you're like that, that the violence or the, the war that, that um, son is persecuting involves a lot of death, involves a lot of violence. It's a lot of, um, you know, it could, it could, it could be read as defensive, but also, you know, it's pretty clear that in the, in the past, there's a lot of actions that are more like, you know, we want to be a power in the region, you know, so maybe a little less justifiable from that perspective. It's, I feel it's an interesting point about, about like empire justifies violence, like just by its nature, empire building romanticizes violence. Um, fighting back against violence often requires some kind of violence. It's, it's not without, however, its moral and personal costs. And I think that's that's kind of where I fell down because because I myself am someone who who tries or tried you know to like really hold a more kind of pacifist notion of of, of morality and it just it just kind of kind of broke apart on the shoals of reality you know that there's just a lot of it's just we live steeped in violence how do you how do you fight that you know how do you how do you break out of that even a little um, and I think a lot of of what of what makes it so hard is that violence kind of atomizes you. I think it, I think it, it, it isolates people in a lot of ways. It makes it very hard, especially, especially violence that um, is not just physical, although it always has a physical element, but that, that kind of psychological constant pressure of disenfranchisement, of poverty, of of um, racism, all of those systems, they're violent systems, but they're not always violent systems. You know, they always have a component of what we can consider like physical violence, but they're not always all about physical violence. And the rest of it, that psychological violence is, is, is it just warps people. And I think that to me was like the part that I, I desperately wanted to be able to, to show how, how what Phyllis does, and she does a lot of bad things. She starts out doing a lot of bad things. She's not you know, she's a very complicated character, but a lot of the reason why she is the way she is is because of that kind of, the ways that you end up having to figure out how to live in that kind of system. You, you, you talked before, and when we did a panel last month, which kind of seems like yes. last year, do you remember that <laughs> panel? Yeah, you talked about how it was, how character-driven Trouble the Saints is. And it strikes me from hearing you say this now, that it's both about her, it's character-driven about her, but you're also, it's also character driven, if I can use that term more globally, about society, the society she lives in. She's really dr dr drilling down into how, how that society functions psychologically as well as sh the individuals within it. Um, yeah. So I found that fascinating and harrowing, harrowing at times. Well, I feel like, you know, getting into the society, 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of ways, it's the only way to explain those characters. I mean, and that's just, and in general, you know, because it's historical fiction, it's relatively recent historical fiction, obviously. Um, you know, I'm talking about my grandparents' time period. You know, I'm talking about things that, that people I know lived through. And, and, to, and to try to really understand how it would mark you to go through those sorts of experiences. Um, you know, it still marks me going through things that, that are, are certainly less, less harrowing than, than stuff that my dad and my grandfather went through, you know? And so that to me is, is something that I wanted to, to kind of break open a little, you know, it's, I actually, this, it reminds me of a question I like had for you having finished Unconquerable Sun like yesterday was I was so fascinated by, by the choices you made in spinning the society because I, I appreciated very much that the, the, there was, there was no noticeable patriarchy. There was no um, discrimination on the basis of, of gender or sexual orientation or, um, or much on the basis of ethnicity. But what there absolutely was, and you, and you called out a number of times, was a lot of class-based discrimination, a lot of, of grave inequality, which I thought, you know, it makes sense. It's still an empire, right? And like almost kind of by definition, an empire is, is a society that's, that, that rests upon, at the very least, a violence of, of, of the exploitation of, of its lower classes to support it's, it's elite, you know, and so I, I kind of wondered, I don't know, I wondered, I wondered about, about how the extent to which kind of removing certain axes of oppression, but maintaining others kind of influence the ways you might have departed from the story, because I mean, fortunately, I am not very familiar at all with the story of Alexander the Great, so that, that aspect of things I couldn't really, I just, I just wondered, you know, how, how you decided to to maintain those oppressions, and if that is going to maybe in the future kind of come up in 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 the ways that the characters interact with one another, or like the story that they're going to tell, you know, I just I this is something that I was really, especially towards the end, you know, because there's like this whole sequence in 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 basically a shanty town, and so I was really really curious about that. Well. Well, actually, one of the there, there's a lot of wrestling that goes on, as you know, when we write, right? And um, and one of the things I knew I had to do to make the Alexander character work was the, one of the, the the most crucial thing to me in my reading about Alexander is that he grew up believing that he was fit to rule. There was no question, no one, okay, he was young. When he became king, he was young. So that was the thing. Well, he's pretty young to, to do this. But other than that, no one questioned his fitness to rule. So that was the essential, that one of the core questions I had to ask myself when I knew I was going to make Alexander a woman was, if it's a patriarchal society, then she has to fight against the patriarchy and then it's not Alexander's story anymore. No one can doubt. So that, no one can doubt her fitness to rule, not much like our society, is it, right. right? You know, but so that changed that for me. But the other element, another element, there's many elements of Macedonian society was that it was a monarchy. And there was a gulf between the people who had the cavalry, who had the horses, who had the, a lot of the land and the farmers and you know, the craftsmen who Alexander's father, Philip, trained up into the best army of his day. But that was his innovation to use those people and train them. He believed they could be trained into like this crack infantry that nobody could defeat at the time. So now we have the class divide because you can't have that system without some divide or another divide. And the divide in the future doesn't, the gender aspects don't matter in that sense. Not that they don't matter, but they don't matter in the same way. And so I felt like I could pull those out, but right. that I had to keep the class divide. But then there's a part of me who wanted to also wrestle with that. And that is where those other elements of the story, Zizou's story and Tiana's story, 
both will, there's going to be more with those later, this other one of the people who are kind of the forgotten people, the people who don't have a place in society, um, the people who are cast aside, the flotsam, that empire and, and war kind of cast aside. And, and you see a lot more of the empire in book two as well. And that's a whole nother, it's, that's much more fleshed out. From right now, you've only really seen it from the military aspect, but it gets much more fleshed out. So I think it's just, you know, I think we're wrestling both with our history, right? With history, but also with ourselves and how we live in today's world and what we want to see. That's that to me. And that's what I love science fiction and fantasy for. Um, it gives us a landscape to do that on. Yeah, it's a great way of highlighting certain things, you know, because I feel like you know, like life, real life, it's extremely messy. And I like recapitulating some of that messiness, but there's always a point at which when I'm writing things, I think this is just, you know, it's just, it's starting to get so convoluted. And what I'm trying to do is dial down into this one thing, you know? And so I think fantasy allows you, science fiction and fantasy allow you to sort of like pare back a little because you can just change the canvas. And so makes it a little easier to, to really dig into one particular aspect. And so I'm so excited for the second book. <laughs> that sounds really interesting. Cause you know, I mean, cause I'm always that person who's like, who reads the fantasy novels and like, yes, 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 kings, kings, kings. But like, when you please tell me about the life of the people in the taverns, I just can't, I have never been able to shut off that part of my brain. So when people actually pay attention to it, I love it. <laughs> I, I'm the same because I do the same thing. It's like, okay, we, we, you know, enough of these people. And I picked up books or started to, I started to watch that show, The Crown, right? And I got about halfway the first ep through the first episode and I thought, I just don't want to live in this space for multiple <laughs> seasons. I know, you know, people say it's good, but I just don't, it's not what I want to see anymore. So, yeah. so I had to wrestle with that too. It's like, I chose to write this about these people who are the rulers. So what am I going to do to make it possible for me to write about it in a way that allows me to bring in other aspects and other elements that I want to see in stories like mm -hmm. this? So cool. Yeah, so this kind of brings up a, a kind of a little bit of a, a craft question and, and, you know, both of you write in multiple genres and, you know, you both have written young adult novels. So I'm curious to hear, you know, what sort of leads you, how you sort of know where, what audience you're writing for, what challenges you face writing for, um, you know, writing in this genre versus young adult, that sort of thing, and, and how, you know, whether that was a consideration with these particular stories or how you come to those um, decisions really. Um, well, Travel the Saints is is su is very much an adult novel, and it and I wrote it kind of coming off of writing two young adult novels, and I guess probably I knew from the beginning. I mean, I certainly knew from the beginning it was an adult novel just because P is thirty five, and so that and 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 she's very firmly that age. It's, it's not just, you know, she could be whatever age. It's, it's that she's someone who's, who, who's made certain choices and has made them for a while. You know, she has to live with those choices now. And it's not, you know, it's not like she's young and naive. She didn't understand. No, she should not be anywhere near as naive as she is in a certain way, you know? Um, and, and that to me was really interesting. I think possibly because I had written, I'd spent so much time, um, at, at the kind of cusp age of 17, 18, um, which is an age I love writing about. And I am writing a YA novel right now. And, you know, it's great. It's just that I'd, I'd spent so much time there and I, I think I wanted to say, okay, so, so, you know, to me, when you're writing young adult, you're writing about that moment, that moment of self-discovery of, or of realization where you're becoming an adult and you have to look and make your choices about the world that you're living in and the world that you want to be able to live in. And, and you can no longer rely on your parents' judgments or on, on other authorities' judgments. And that moment is, is really fraught and I, and I love writing about it, but to me, an adult novel is someone who's kind of gone past that and maybe never confronted in a really decisive way, but has, has in whatever way, confronted him in some way and has made certain choices and that kind of regret of roads not followed or just sort of wistfulness or just kind of confusion about how they got to where they got is 
is much more present. And that's not, that's not a kind of, that's not a sensation that you're not going to get out of most young adult novels, just from the, from the way, the place that, that a 17, 18 year old has in the world, you know, they're, they're just newer. <laughs> Things are new. And so as a writer, that's also, that's exciting, but it's, it's very specific. And so I wanted the opposite of that, you know? And so that was kind of how I ended up with, with the story of, of Phyllis and Dev and, and Tamara, because, because the three of them are, I mean, she's younger than Phyllis and Dev, but they, they've all made certain choices, you know, and there are, none of them are, are great choices. So they all, all kind of have to, have to look and evaluate and, and judge and then decide to change if they can. And of course, changing is a lot easier when you're 17 than it is when you're 35 or older. And so I think that is not that it's impossible, right? But it's, there's a lot more weight. There's a lot more weight behind that like a lot more more momentum that you have to pivot and so i think that can maybe i think when i uh, you know maybe i thought you know oh that's just so much you know it's just, it's so difficult to try to maneuver a character like that they're so much lighter and more nimble or something as a young adult character but actually it's really interesting in its in its own right and i'm really glad because because phyllis is by far the oldest um protagonist i've written I thought she's all that old, but I just kind of tended to write much younger protagonists. And so it was, it was really refreshing. Well, you know, I'm just a world building dork. Uh, I've been drawing maps since I was a kid and, and I've only, all my adults are adult, are adult, except for the Court of Fives young adult fantasy trilogy. And I will say, that I agree with what Elias said that the, it, it, it allows you to focus. You have to focus on what this 17 year old, her relationship with the world, what she discovers, what she discovers is wrong about how, what she thought the world was and how she deals with that and the choices she makes. But it's very focused around her and her view of what she's seeing and her discovery. And that's what's exciting to me as a reader about what we call YA, um, which is that sense of discovery. In my adult fiction, I get really excited about the worlds. I mean, I'm a character driven writer, but I get so excited about the worlds because I love history and just like this could happen and that could happen. And then these people were related to her and then, you know, this happened, whatever. And then you can't have all that in YA, you've got to trim it out. Uh, and I had editors <laughs> who would keep writing me and saying, this three page digression on the relationship of these three families um, is really interesting. Now can you reduce it to one sentence? And then I would reduce it to one sentence because I would have to figure out what does my main character need to know? So with Unconquerable Sun, it began Gan, its original conception was as an adult space opera. And then I went through a phase where I thought maybe I could write this as a YA novel because she's young in the first book. Um, but I quickly realized that I was so into the world building because you've got at least three different, you know, you've got the Macedonia analog and you've got the Persian Empire analog and you've got the, uh, the, the Greek Athens analog just alone that it was too much and I wasn't willing to pull it down to that other place and the other thing about the Alexander story is people like Alexander people like his father Philip they lived in they didn't they weren't here solo heroes striding like you know across the landscape you know alone they were surrounded by people they lived in groups of people who supported them, who fought against them. They didn't conceive of themselves as sol solo individuals like Rambo. That's, that's such a, to me, that's such an American thing. So that also meant that Sun had to have a group of people she interacted with. She had to see herself in relationship to all these different people. And it didn't work to me if I pulled too many of them out. Um, so it became, so I, I saw that it couldn't be a young adult novel, that it was an adult novel. And that's what it, that's what brought me to the end result and all the world building. <laughs> so. I thought we could um, maybe look at some of these questions from the audience and, you know, folks, 
please feel free to uh, to keep them coming. We'll we'll keep chatting for a bit. Um, so uh, Garrick, maybe that's just a username, but Garrick says uh, for Alaya, um, obviously a bunch of real life characters are mentioned in the book. And is Victor based on any particular real life mobster? What was the process of research that went into establishing the the setting of this era in New York? And and I'll expand that um, because you know Kate obviously is pulling in some real life inspiration as well. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about you know. What was research like for these books and, and, and what's real? Uh, I don't know if the Juju assassins are necessarily historical, but I'm guessing some of the stuff in there is. Yeah, um, there's definitely, it's kind of a, a liberal mix of, of history and, and not real, not reality, basically. Um, I, tried to, I tried to like stick him pretty close to, to historical. It's a very, very light um, alternate history you know um so victor is is most mostly dutch schultz with uh, a mix a smattering of a couple of other uh mobsters lower east side mobsters um he dutch schultz in particular uh is is interesting and, and the reason why i like i kind of honed in on 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 victor's kind of mo because dutch schultz was a white mobster who um had was gunned down in a <laughs> really truly been like absurd like mob showdown uh, a couple of years later but he he went in and and basically did a hostile takeover of the Harlem numbers racket so the Harlem numbers racket was this system of I don't know um, they call it policy uh or playing the numbers or you know like what's your number so basically it was a kind of amateur gambling um like a ring just like an am like a gambling game that people played in harlem um and in other black neighborhoods throughout um new york city it was particularly strong in harlem so there were a whole bunch of of kind of famous especially in in um the roaring 20s so this is you know obviously predates the the story of the novel but but in the Roaring Twenties, there were a lot of there was a lot of kind of more prosperity. It was it was very quickly sucked out of Harlem, partly due to things like Dutch Schultz storming in there and, and like taking all their money out. Um, also, just the depression, like all depressions, hit the black community twenty times harder than it hit anybody else. And so all the the kind of temporary wealth that they'd built up um, kind of collapsed. But in the meantime, there was really this flourishing, and and uh, so you had people like. Um, Stephanie St. Clair, Madame Queen of Policy. Uh, you had Casper Holstein. All of these, like these larger-than-life characters, um, patrons of the arts, also activists for for um, equality and Black liberation, and just this the kind of all of it kind of combined. And so the numbers running. So Phyllis kind of has a history as a numbers runner. Um, in Harlem when she was younger, um, and a lot of famous people were numbers. So the numbers, let me, sorry, I feel like I should just explain what on earth they are there. It's literally just, you pick three numbers, um, and they they used, the first way they did it was was they would take like the mutuals, which I think was sort of like some kind of, I'm a little unclear on this, but it was, well, exactly technically it was, but it was basically, um, I think it was something like the, the final number of that, like the Dow Jones Industrial Average quote closed or something like that. and. And it was a it was a long string of numbers, and so they just said like the last three numbers in the published mutuals are going to be our lucky numbers. And then you had these black owned banks that kind of maintained the numbers. So the numbers were illegal, but they weren't mob business. Um, people played for pennies often. Um, the payouts sometimes um, allowed people to 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 buy houses or cars. You know, sometimes it really did help people's lives, and it was it was all very kind of local. And most people kind of dismissed it. Uh, they were, you know, there's like, what is this? You know, whatever people, but everyone played. I mean, everyone, everyone, everyone played the numbers. I mean, this, and this continued through the 60s, at least of like really popular numbers playing. Um, it probably died out in like the 70s, 80s, but it was, um, it, was a, it was a huge deal. And what happened was it eventually became enough of this, this big thing in Harlem that white gangsters noticed. And that's the part where, where, you know, the kind of themes of Trouble the Saints really come into play. And so Dutch Schultz basically rammed his way in there and said, you know, give me a cut. 
give me cut for protection, i.e. protection from me killing you. And that um, there's actually a scene in Trouble of Saints that more or less um, directly addresses this sort of hostile takeover of the system. And so once the, the white mobsters took over the black banks, it really, I mean, they, the numbers didn't end, obviously, but it really changed things. And it's just one of those ways of kind of this constant disenfranchisement of, of black owned businesses. And and they were, they were absolutely businesses. I mean, there was nothing violent about them. They, again, they weren't mob operations before the mob got involved in them. They were just kind of like quasi legal gambling boys. Um, and so that, that was a huge amount of research that went into it. So like all of that stuff about the policy and the numbers, and then they all kind of ties into the hands and this notion of a little bit of luck that can, you can use against people, but, or, or to kind of push yourself up in the system. But if you do it all together, you might get somewhere, right? But if everyone is, is kind of doing their own thing, it's all sort of just like little, little flashes, you know, but little, little flashes of light that aren't illuminating enough. And so that was a lot of what I researched. There's, um, there's a lot of um, also research into systems of, you know, the conjurer, uh, how kind of Zora Neale Hurston has, has amazing, you know, aside from her amazing novels, she was an anthropologist who, who did really interesting research on, on conjure and um, kind of African diasporic magic traditions in the South and in the Caribbean. And so I read a lot of, of her, in her collection of Mules and Yin, I, you know, it was really great. So, so there was a lot of that, that was a lot of what I read. And also of course, novels from the time period, um, that kind of stuff. So it was, it was more kind of like trying to get the, an atmosphere, a feeling of how it felt to live then how it would feel to be pressed up against all of these strictures. Oh, and, and Langston Hughes has an amazing short story collection called um, The Ways of White Folk, which is like a revelation and was, was really fundamental because it, it, it really honed a lot of different ideas that I kind of had floating around. It's just, it's really great. So that was my, there's a lot more, but you know, that was kind of, those were the highlights of my research. I was going to say you did a great job of capturing it. And then I realized like, I actually didn't experience that. So I just believe that you did a really great job of capturing <laughs> right. it in my imagination. Um, Kate, what about you? What, um, what kind of research uh, did you take into account or not take into account um, with your book? Well, there's a lot of Alexander material. I mean, a new biography of Alexander the Great comes out every couple of years and people buy it and it takes some new approach. Uh, I started with the Romans, the Ro Roman historians, most famously Arian, who wrote the campaign of Alexander and is, he's probably the best known of the Roman biographers. So he would have been writing in, I don't know, I'm bad at date, um, a while ago. And Diodorus, I mean, uh, I didn't use Plutarch so much except for the, the gossipy stuff from Plutarch because he's filled with gossipy stuff. Um, and then from there I moved on. There's actually a lot of fragments because none of, one of the most interesting things to me about the Alexander history is that it's all, most of it is mediated to us through two places. One is the Roman historians, because again, the empire, the Roman empire loved him. He was absolutely considered the best general who had ever lived in the history of the world by them. Um, but all of the sources that came from Alexander's time, either people who were writing at his time, like Callisthenes, who was writing the official history, um, or people who went through the campaign with him and then wrote later their memoirs or their histories, that stuff didn't hasn't survived to the present day but the roman historians all had access to it and used it as part of their as their source work for it so arian famously said he he, he has a whole little historiographic part at the beginning of his, his of the campaign um, where he talks about the different sources and why he used the ones he did and my absolute favorite thing that he says in that regard is where he says and he uses Aristonus, I think and then Ptolemy who was one of Alexander's companions which meant one of his generals and um, another nobleman from that Macedonian high high court and 
Ptolemy wrote in his old age, and because Ptolemy lived a long time, he wrote a memoir of his experiences. So, and Ptolemy by this point was the king and pharaoh of the new Ptolemaic, named after himself because why be modest? Um, he wrote his own memoir. So you can just imagine this guy, he's 80 years old, telling the memoir of how I got to be who I am now, right? And Arian says, well, I use Ptolemy because I figured since he was a king, he would be, I can't remember how he phrases it. It's like he would be less, he, he doesn't quite say he'd be less likely to be lying. And so it's not clear if he means he'd be less likely to be lying because he might feel his honor was at stake or whether he'd be less likely to lie because he'd figure people would catch him out. I don't know, but I'm intrigued. That's the one, the one source I wish we had was Ptolemy's memoirs because you can just imagine. But all of this is filtered through how people wanted to see Alexander because he became a symbol after his death, that's a spoiler, but it happened like 2,400 years ago. Sorry, guys. He became a symbol, even more than what he did, who he was and what he accomplished became a symbol. And the other fascinating set of sources is the sources, the, the Alexander romance and the legendary and only mildly historical tales that you find as far afield as India, Persia, there were all kinds of stories in Persia. Of course there were, because he had come in. Um, Ethiopia, you find stories as far afield as Ethiopia. And then in the European Middle Ages, one of the most popular story cycles wasn't the King Arthur we expect, but the Ale what's called the Alexander Romance, which is a series of legendary stories woven together in different versions. So those are, I used all of those to kind of get a sense of this idea of who people wanted to see this person as. And then I used that to kind of decide who were the characters I had to keep direct analogs of and how I wanted to approach this idea, the idea of Alexander. Because I think when we write about a, an individual like Alexander now, we're really writing about the idea of who they were more than about the actuality of who they were. Super interesting. I think there's a ton to dig in there. Um, but I know that we also are winding down on time. So I'm going to totally switch tones and, and ask a question from Nivere. Um, hello, uh, which is if Phyllis and Sun had to battle, who would win? Or would they team up and destroy everyone else? Great question. I, I'm going to go for team up. Yeah, I think th that'd be good because I really feel like the world <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't survive like the kaiju battle that I would turn into. That would, <laughs> yeah. You know? We'll go with team, we'll go with team up here. <laughs> yes, team, team, team up. <laughs> like, oh my, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a set of personalities right there. I don't know. Yeah, they would, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Imagine those two at, at dinner. Together. Right, I was just about to say, I'm like, not even if they actually battled like with this, just like trading barbs. I can only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how about we close it out with, um, you know, I always love to ask authors what they're loving and, you know, so what, what have you been turning towards in, in this time in reading or, or, or what are you excited for that's coming up? Um, I'm reading Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse, which is her first epic fantasy. It's coming out in October, and it's uh, an epic fantasy landscape based in uh, it, like Mesoamerican cultures. Um, it's fascinating. Put it on your list. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've been I've been in the in like that kind of weird quarantine like novel what's a novel stage unfortunately as that as a matter of fact thank you so much thank you so much kate because a gun crumble sun finally broke my dry spell i finally wrote, i read a novel for the first time in like two months so i was like i was i was like this is so i i remember this feeling of being enveloped by a novel and I just, I just keep reading it and I'm just so happy like that feeling. That's why I like reading. I totally forgot. So that, um, hopefully this is not the last one. Um, I mean, 
really the thing that I'm, I, I have that I really want to finish soon is Year of Wonders by Geraldine Brooks, just because it's all about the plague. <laughs> so I was, I just find it kind of like interesting, the, the plague and like the similarities between past plagues and current plagues, like not a lot has changed, at least not as much as you would think would change. Um, so, so yeah, I don't, I don't, as far as, as new things coming out, as I said, I mean, I've just been, a lot of things have been, a lot of things have been happening in my life, so I'm a little bit like, what, what? Um, I'm hope I'm hoping I'm hoping for for a little more calm and tranquility and and good novels to read in my hammock. We could all use those, and yeah. you know, for for those of you watching, here's some two pretty good hammock reads, in my opinion. You can read anything in a hammock, so <laughs> <laughs> even a plague novel, which my novel is not, so. <laughs> Exactly. That, I mean, that's, a, these are both, you know, really great kind of escapes. And, and, you know, that's, for me, that's what I've needed right now is like the, the, the plague thing. I, I'm going to hold off on that. I'll, I'll read that next year. <laughs> well, Aliyah and Kate, thank you so much for, for chatting with us awesome. to the audience. Thank you so much for, you know, coming with us over here. I'm so sorry about the, you know, the whole technical thing. They really need to give a, a lesson on how to run the internet in, in Bookseller 101 training. Um, so uh, thank you all again. I'm going to put the link to pick up these books one more time in the chat box. So I hope that you'll all check them out. And Aliyah and Kate, you know, this is so cool because you're both on totally different parts of the the country or the continent um but you know someday maybe we'll get to do it all in person that's, that's wouldn't my that dream. be nice right <laughs> yeah yeah thank you to to you lila and to porter square books for hosting this yes thank you so much Lila, for, for helping us figure this out and everyone for coming yeah. i'm so glad everyone for being we're nimble <laughs>